Today we're going to talk about exchange particles. And exchange particles are responsible for all the field forces out there. So they're going to be responsible for gravitational fields, electric fields, magnetic fields, etc. So exchange particles have everything to do with fields. And when we first started talking about fields, we just used them to explain action at a distance. They were just kind of postulated and no physical explanation was given. Now we'd like to give kind of a physical explanation. So let's imagine we've got a negative charge out there in space. Then of course we get an electric field around that negative charge. But what is that electric field made of? Well it's kind of made of tiny little disturbances. Some of the disturbances would be kind of localized in space and some of them would be more spread out, etc. So they're disturbances. They're somewhat photon-like in character in that they're electromagnetic, but they're almost like a different existence. They're totally unobservable. As an analogy, we could imagine a totally flat pond, absolutely no waves on it. Well, there'd still be motion. The molecules in the water would still be moving around. And ordinarily, we could never observe that motion. However, if the molecules move together, they can make a wave and we can observe that. Now with the molecules, we can kind of extend how we observe and we can, we can observe molecular motion. But due to something called the uncertainty principle, we would never be able to observe these disturbances. So in that sense, they're a different existence. And because they're unobservable, they're often given the name virtual particles. And what's key about these disturbances is they don't last. The disturbance comes and goes. So it kind of pops into existence and then disappears. Or we could say that it was emitted by the negative charge and then it was absorbed. So our electric field is composed of these unobservable photon-like disturbances. So now let's bring another negative charge in and see what's going to happen. So once again it would have these disturbances around it, some of them very localized, some of them very spread out, but something new can now happen because this photon here could be absorbed by that negative charge. Before we added the second charge there'd be just as many emissions as absorptions so you wouldn't have any net force. But now this changes everything because this negative charge is going to have in this case one more absorption than emission and that's going to cause an impact force in this direction. And the other negative charge is going to have one more emission than it has absorption. And so it's going to kind of recoil and it will feel a force in this direction. And the net result would be a repulsive force. So it's not hard to visualize how these photon-like disturbances, and these photon-like disturbances are an example of what we call an exchange particle, how they result in repulsive forces. It's like two people on roller skates. You've got, say, your negative charge here, your negative charge here, some of the photons that are emitted by one of the negative charges are absorbed by the other negative charge. So there's a recoil force for the negative charge that emits but doesn't absorb and there's an impact force for the negative charge that absorbs one of these disturbances that it didn't emit. And so we get our repulsive force. So pretty easy to imagine a repulsive force not so easy to imagine an attractive force as between a negative charge and a positive charge. And I'm going to give you a couple analogies here, but I think at least for some of you these analogies are going to be a little bit suspect, and I think you'll want to dig deeper. But it'll probably be a few years down the road before you can really dig much deeper. So here are the two common analogies that are used to explain an attractive force between, say, a proton and an electron, or really any two particles that have an attractive force between them. In the first analogy, let's say 
this is your positive particle, this is your negative particle. The exchange particles, the photon-like disturbances, have a boomerang-like quality to them. So the positive charge emits one of these disturbances, it travels along and comes back and exerts an impulse on the negative charge that way. And then symmetrically, the negative charge is emitting these disturbances and they're getting absorbed by the positive charge, causing an attractive force. Or maybe what's a little simpler is to imagine that the two charges are kind of fighting for this disturbance. As these two people on roller skates are kind of fighting for the ball between them and that causes them to come closer together. There's an attractive force between them because they're fighting for that exchange particle. So I've been talking about these photon-like disturbances in the field. Well, it turns out the disturbances are different for different fields. So we're going to be talking about, say, gluon-like disturbances and graviton-like disturbances, etc. One for each type of field. These disturbances go by a lot of different names. Usually the different names are used to emphasize one idea or another but they really all mean the same thing. So the IB tends to just stick with exchange particles for these disturbances. In the standard model, they're called the gauge bosons. They're also known as virtual particles, and that's because they can't be observed. They're too short-lived, and that's related to the uncertainty principle. So the uncertainty principle has a very important role in describing this model for force. And in fact, the uncertainty principle allows you to determine the range of these fields. And of course, because they're carrying the force, they're sometimes called the force carriers or even the force particles. But remember, it's all the same thing. I was saying earlier that each type of field has its own exchange particle. So for electromagnetic fields, the exchange particle was these photon like disturbances, or we'll just say photons. And the cause of those photon-like disturbances was the electric charge. So we say the electromagnetic field operates or acts on electric charge. Of course, if those charges are moving, then we get the magnetic field. Now, the other three types of field at the most fundamental level, or we could say the other three types of fundamental force are gravity, the strong force, and the weak force. The exchange particle for gravity is the graviton. Turns out nobody's ever detected a graviton, so that's still kind of theoretical. For the strong force, the exchange particle is the gluon. And for the weak force, there's actually three exchange particles. There's the W and Z bosons, but there's two varieties of the W boson. There's a positively charged version and a negatively charged version. Now, as you know, gravity always acts on mass. And we said that the electromagnetic field always acts on electric charge. The strong force acts on a different type of charge, the color charge. And its gluons and quarks are the only things that have color charge. The weak force it acts on flavor. Now you might be asking, what is flavor? Well, when I talked about the quarks, I talked about up quarks and down quarks and strange quarks and charmed quarks. Those are the flavors of the quarks. The leptons as well had flavors. So when I talked about tau particles and tau neutrinos and electrons and electron neutrinos, I was talking about the flavor of the leptons. So it's just the quarks and the leptons that interact via that weak force. As to the relative strength of these four forces, the strong force is the strongest. And if we give it a relative strength of one, the next strongest would be the electromagnetic and it would be one over 137th as large. Next in line would be the weak force. It's about one millionth as big as the strong force. And then the gravitational force is truly minuscule. 
it's, I believe, 10 to the minus 41 as strong as the strong force. But remember, gravity never cancels out. So it's actually gravity that dominates over long ranges. So if you have great distances, gravity wins out. We say that the electromagnetic and the gravitational force have an infinite range. The strong force has a range approximately equal to the size of a nucleus, about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And that's how it's able to hold together the nucleus. The weak force has a much, much smaller range. In fact, it's only about 1 1,000th the diameter of a proton. So if the strong force is a short-range force, the weak force is an extremely short-range force. In terms of examples of these forces, you should be able to come up with thousands of examples of gravitation and electromagnetic. Let's just write something down. For gravitation, we'll say the Earth about the Sun, that gravitational force between the Earth and the Sun. And how about for the electromagnetic force, we use the example of a hydrogen atom, that attraction between a proton and an electron. More interesting, the strong force, well, it holds the nucleus together. It's responsible for that. But that kind of turns out to be a residual effect. And what's more important is that the strong force holds together quarks in, say, baryons or mesons. So let's just say holds together baryons such as neutrons and protons. The weak force, it's what's responsible for radioactive decay. Even though it's very weak and very short range, it has a very important role in our universe. It's also responsible for keeping the stars burning. In this table here, I'd say it's the most important thing from this video in terms of IB testing. Now, it seems like a fantastic simplification of our universe to reduce it down to just four fundamental forces. However, physicists are always searching for symmetry and simplicity. And they were able to show that at really, really high temperatures, the electromagnetic force and the weak force their exchange particle is indistinguishable. And so that really reduces our number of fundamental forces to just three. This one, when they're combined, it's called the electro-weak force. And by the way, the high temperatures we're talking about here haven't been present in the universe since just after the Big Bang. And of course, the ultimate simplicity is one. So physicists like Albert Einstein searched and searched for a grand unified force, a grand unified theory that would unify all the forces. Now I wanted to give you a few more details about the strong force and about and in particular about color charge. So we're already familiar with one type of charge, electric charge. And it comes in two different varieties. There's positive and there's negative. Now there's nothing intrinsically negative about an electron. And we really just chose the names positive and negative because the mathematics of positive and negative numbers paralleled the way these charges interacted. And it's very much the same way with color charge. But with color charge you got three different varieties. And they get the names red, green, and blue. Not because the charge has anything to do with color, but because the way that colors combine parallels the way that quarks combine. The only things out there that have color charge are the quarks and the exchange particle for the strong force, the gluons. Nothing else, including the baryons and the mesons, have a color charge. So baryons and mesons have zero or no color charge. So let's say we've got a baryon here with three quarks in it. One of the quarks would have to be red, one would have to be green, and one would have to be blue. If we combine those three colors, we get white, which is really no color. So all baryons have three different colored quarks, giving them no color.
If we want to consider the mesons, let's say we've got a blue quark and an anti-blue quark. Well, anti-blue is really yellow, so we could call this yellow or we could call it anti-blue. But when you combine a color and its opposite, once again you get white, you get no color. So the way that colors combine exactly parallels the way that quarks combine. Now you might be asking yourselves, how did physicists know that there must be three different types of color charge? Well, it's related to what's called the Pauli exclusion principle. And this isn't something you need to know, but for those of you who are interested, listen up. The Pauli exclusion principle is responsible for electrons stacking up in energy levels in an atom. And scientists realized that there was two electrons in that first energy level. So those two electrons were in exactly the same state, and that wasn't allowed by the Pauli exclusion principle. So in order to describe this, they invented spin. And they said that in that first energy level, one of the electrons would be spin up, and one of the electrons would be spin down. Something very similar happened with quarks. They found a baryon that had three strange quarks in it. And that wasn't allowed by the Pauli exclusion principle. Each quark had to be in a different state. So that was explained using color charge. One of the quarks would always have to have a red color charge. One of the quarks would have to have a blue color charge. And one of the quarks would have to have a green color charge. And in truth, those S quarks would actually be exchanging gluons and their color charges would constantly be changing. As a final point, I wanted to point out that there's a difference between the strong force that we've been talking about in this video and the strong nuclear force that we talked about so much in nuclear physics. So the strong force, that's generally a force between quarks. Whereas the strong nuclear force is a force between nucleons. So here we've got a couple protons. They attract each other by the strong nuclear force. And there's something called a pion that kind of plays the role of an exchange particle. But the more fundamental interaction that's taking place is the gluon exchange between the quarks causing them to attract. And this is the strong force. The strong nuclear force is a residual effect of the strong force. And we've seen residual effects before. It's kind of a second order effect. If you know about van der Waal forces, van der Waal bonding, then you know about residual forces. So here we've got two atoms. They're both electrically neutral, so they shouldn't attract each other, at least on the first order. But because the electrons are mobile here, they get attracted to the nearby positive charge, and we end up with kind of a secondary or residual force, which is called the van der Waal force. So our strong nuclear force is a residual force, of our strong force. So let's summarize, maybe not the big ideas from the videos, but the ideas that will be most important on IB exams. And the first would be knowing this little table. So knowing what the four fundamental forces are, what their exchange particles are, their relative strength, their range, and being able to give a few examples of each fundamental force. And the other thing that you need to know is that there is a strong force and there's a strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is a residual effect of the strong force and the strong force is that force most importantly between quarks so that it holds together baryons and mesons and what it's really acting on is that color charge. So things that have color charge will involve the strong force. And for color charge, you should know that there's three types. There's red, green, and blue color charge. And that mesons and baryons, even though they're composed of quarks, they have no color charge. And this effectively parallels the way that we add colors together. So red, green, and blue added together makes white no color.
And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.